And now the fourth case, I have my first-hand experience. Now, oh, I didn't I think Kamim is Kanta, but I happen to know this person. It's called the Goodwin case. Betsy Goodwin, or oh, Elizabeth Goodwin, who is uh, right in the middle, right here. Okay. And uh, he, she was a rising star in RNA theory, and I'm the RNA biologist, so I knew her. And at one point, she even inter interviewed at Ohio State University, where I worked for many years. I met with her in my office. I went to dinner with her. She was very, very bright, supremely confident, and very persuasive, and had a charismatic personality to attract people to her. No wonder the University of Wisconsin recruited her immediately to get her a tenure. And in fact, Ohio State was trying to recruit her too, to give her a tenure position right away. And because she has such a charismatic personality, students all get attracted to her lab. And she was very persuasive. Okay, So they all attracted to that. But then she was found to be falsifying in her grant proposal. So falsifying data does not, not only in, uh, exist in the uh, in papers but also could possibly include in the in the uh, grant proposal it was she was caught that and in fact by her lab graduate student and postdoc all right so she published paper in this kind of journal nature structure and molecular biology molecular cell developmental biology all top journal paper now she was reported by her student and postdoc it took a tremendous of struggle among the graduate student and postdoc to decide what to do. When they in first in found that, that she, was, she has potentially forged the data. So the first thing they did was that some courageous graduate student, after private discussion, aside, no, not, not, not letting uh, Dr. Goodwin know, one of the graduate students confronted her in person, one-to-one. -one. Say, the grant proposal has some data that contains some data that has never been done before. And she said, oh, I must have screwed up. I must have screwed up. She, she claimed that. But eventually, there are several cases that keep coming up. They, they, then the students struggle and struggle and struggle to decide what to do. Because this is immense. If you report Dr. Goodwin, and if Dr. Goodwin get, get fired from the University of Wisconsin Madison, you, don't have, you have no PhD. You have no postdoctoral career. You have no future. Science run a huge report on this issue, and then exploring the consequence of telling the truth. Don't say that would not happen. That potentially can happen, OK? So eventually, the court sentenced her. Uh, try, uh, court uh, sentenced her, but she pleaded guilty. So she was fined for two year probation. Didn't go to the jail, and then she paid five hundred dollars, which is nothing. Mm -hmm. And but she has to pay back uh, an uh, uh, one hundred thousand dollars for her past grants. So we, what we have seen so far is that there are four cases. Like you see David Baltimore, Sean, two Japanese investigators, as well as the Betsy Goodwin. I was so appalled, so shocked to hear Betsy Goodwin's uh, uh, story because I found her she was so smart and so attractive and so charismatic. But it happens. Okay, so what, do you have, what is the message from here, from the, from, from the first four slides? What's the point in your mind? You recall that in the news some time ago, our Ministry of Educa Education, Jiao Yu Bu Zhang, Minister of Education, say something that actually get attacked by the newspaper. He said, from the ancient time to now, and I changed this world because it's Taiwan, he said, it's China, right? And then, 古今中外, but I changed it to 古今台外, external world. These things happen. And he was heavily attacked by the newspaper. 
but I must concur that he was right. He was absolutely right. Because the cases I mentioned actually they all happened in the very top university. In everywhere. Okay, so the theory, the issue is how bad the scientific misconduct is. Okay, let's take a look. A survey shows that 2% of the scientists admit that they have done something related to scientific misconduct. 2%. Not too bad. 98% of us are fine. Okay, 2%. And the paper is, uh, was cited there. Okay, now the next survey and uh, next finding is that 90% of the academic research data cannot be reproduced in industry, especially drug development data. I'm not joking. This is true. You can you can just go read these two papers, and then these are these are these are peer review papers. Ninety percent are irreproducible from the academic sites to the industry side. And third, sixty percent of the retracted paper, in fact, was caused by scientific misconduct. Not all of them. Some of them, just like Barrymore's paper, actually have no scientific misconduct, but he retracted the paper because the pressure, because the congressional hearing, because the, the US NIH uh, 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 decision to say that he has uh, done something wrong, but not all, okay? Now, the even more severe issue is not only involving the numbers of paper being retracted or how many scientists commit in misconduct. It's more serious than that. It could involve in life. Merck, as you know, a very well-known pharmaceutical company, once put out a very powerful painkiller called Vioxx. And it was instant best-selling. Best-seller. It's so like a heart cake. The medical doctors love it. It, it was very powerful painkiller. They don't have to use morphine. They can use Vioxx. Years later, it was found out that Vioxx has something to do with the heart failure. And then further, further investigation showed that, in fact, Merck knew that, but did not report it. That's another kind of science, uh, scientific misconduct. They knew it already, but they ignored it. They put it aside. Eventually, by calculation, it caused 55,000 premature deaths. And then Merck has to put away nearly $5 billion to settle the legal lawsuit. So that is pretty severe. It's really, really bad. Especially medical research, if that is involving drug discovery. And if that is not reported right, it can kill people. All right, so it's really bad. But now, let's take a look at how bad it is here at home, okay? Now, this paper was taken out from the, uh, just published in 2016 in Mbio. All right. So it, you can go read that paper. But I just want to take one figure out of from that paper. So this is a, a plot, plotted the fraction of published paper. So the, 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 the more people you have, they will publish more paper, right? Like USA, like China, right? And then the, 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 the smaller the country is, just like Taiwan, you will publish less paper. That's as you expect. But in this was plotted against the y-axis. Y-axis is, is the proportion of the paper with image duplications by country. So ideally, you should see the, this linear line, right? So the more paper you publish, you find more misconduct. Right on this line. So take a look at where are we. This is India. OK, not very good for Indian guys. <laughs> You're smiling. This is China, not too surprised, not too big a surprise. And where is Taiwan? There you go. So in fact, in Taiwan, we are actually not doing very well. We are not failing too well. Things happen in Taiwan, as we have seen recently. It's really not, a, really, un, really not unexpected, okay? Now, so then I wanna explore a little bit about why people want to do it. 
So I thought about this issue for a long time because I had been interested in this particular problem, scientific misconduct, for many years. In fact, back in nine, six years ago, uh, Academia Seneca has a meeting, invited some speaker uh, from Australia to give talk on scientific misconduct. And I, I, I was curious. I went to that, that talk. In fact, then I asked the, the speaker to give me his PowerPoint. And I kept them. Surprisingly, I, I kept them all these years. So I was very interested. In it. And so I explored the question, so why do people want to do that? What do you think? What do you think one people want to do that? So I have to come to that, uh, this is a, this, just my view. There are two reasons. Number one is desperation. You are desperate. You are desperate to get your PhD degree. If you don't have a paper, you cannot get your PhD degree. You spend seven years on it. You know this will be your final half years. You get to pump it out. That's one. Second. Assistant professor want to maintain their funding. Senior professor want to maintain their funding. So they fake. Third, assistant professor face a job decision. That's in the US, it's called promotion and tenure. Promotion and tenure system. If you cannot pass promotion and tenure, you will be out in the street. Literally, you have no job. And the decision time is five years in the US. I went through it. I know how hard it was that. OK? So people fake, try to get one paper out, desperate. And potential job loss, of course. A postdoctoral fellow need to publish paper in order to maintain their job. If the, the professor decided that that should be that way, so they fake. OK? And then some people, because they're short of money, they want to fake it and then, then uh, to get a war and do something. And so that's sort of, in, in, in some way, that, those are all financial issues too, deep at the heart of the desperation. Okay. Now, the second part, second major reason is prestige. Prestige. Okay. People want to have a war and fame. Oh, Nobel Award, right? You feel good about it. Some want to have power. They can control resources. They feel good about it. They can run a big cooperation. They can run a big institute. That can also cause the problem. And then somebody want to somebody want to get big money to award. Like I want want this award that has one hundred uh, one hundred thousand ten one hundred or ten thousand dollars or whatever you want to want the award. Okay, so all these really are the underlying reason. It's a human psychological problem. Our, we, every one of us have weaknesses deep inside of us. So there is a line one can easily cross it if you don't, you cannot control yourself. So these are the, the, uh, the underlying reason. Now, so then with that, then let's explore what are scientific misconduct. The first category of scientific misconduct is plagiarism. Plagiarism is basically copy and paste published data or text or data into your paper. OK, everybody kind of knows about that. And this is easy to get. You can easily catch. Uh, this kind of problem is easy to get, get caught because they are software. They can check, can run through all the checks. And then I include this word, safe plagiarism. OK, if you have already published a paper like this, and then in, when you are writing the second paper, you say, OK, oh, it's so hard to write the first paragraph. Let me just copy this part into here, for example. That's a safe plagiarism. That is not allowed either. So many of us have done something like this before. When you are writing material and method, you just take from the old paper and then just copy and paste, put it onto the new paper. That, in theory, is not, this, is not allowed. But that is less problematic. You know, but generally, you can, you, if you want to minimize this, this kind of problem, you can say, OK, the experiment was conducted as described, except in what kind of thing you, you, you then you can get by with that. But say plagiarism can be a, a problem, OK? And it's basically, plagiarism is an act of stealing. You're stealing something from somebody else. Published data, published, data, uh, published text, et cetera. So that you know. You should not do it. 